So good afternoon and thank you all for um, attending um, this talk. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Tom McDermott, who's gonna be talking to us today about um, his uh, research tasks, uh, known as ART004 and WRT1033, um, related to methods to evaluate cost technical risk and opportunity decisions for security assurance in design. With that, Tom, please take it away. Thank you, James. Turn my camera on here. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> hopefully some of you attended the last talk that uh, Peter Beeling did on security engineering. Um, this particular project, ART004, was really planned as something that would uh, sort of extend out from that previous work and system, system or security engineering. <clears throat> particularly to look at standardization across assurance methods and how the tools support that. And then I'll talk just in one slide about a follow-on task, uh, WRT 1033, that's, that wants to integrate these things back together in the space and, and to focus on transition. So I worked this project and led it with, with Peter and also with Dr. Cody Fleming, who was at UVA, now he's at Iowa State. Um, and then... Tim Sherburn and Megan Clifford were the main modelers in this effort, along with Yurgos Bakirsis and, and Chris Duran. So <clears throat> if you think of the standard mission aware security process as being a methodology to elicit requirements and design into a set of models that blend attack models and other things, we were starting with that, but what we really wanted to look at was, can we standardize across typical system and safety assurance uh, case methods? And we also wanted to apply this to a little bit more of a complex system of system study um, to expand out the modeling activities. <clears throat> and finally, the third goal was, was investigate evaluation metrics. And so one of the reasons why we wanted to look at a complex system of system study was uh, to try and understand some more detail about metrics in terms of, of loss benefit and risk reward and those things in the space. So that was the way it started. Bottom line up front on assurance methodologies. Um, so, you know, we tend to think of things like HAZOP analysis or fault and attack tree analysis or structured assurance case modeling languages, this SACM, structured assurance case meta model, as being how we define assurance cases. Um, the system aware work, mission aware work, has, has sort of standardized more on, on STAMP and STPA security, which are uh, what are basically known as loss causation or accident causation models. Um, and focus away from hazard and risk back towards loss in that space. And, and so where it fits in this process is um, even though we can reason about HAZOPs and attack trees and things like that very early on in the conceptual design stage, um, the coverage that you get from those methodologies is completely limited by the experience of the people using them. Um, and what we would like to do is, is move back towards more early stage conceptual models and be for, more formal about how those assurance cases link in. And so, um, so STAMP lets us do that. And then the cybersecurity requirements methodology that Peter talked about and the mission aware meta modeling environment allow us to capture that reasoning uh, well early up, even way back in the mission engineering phase. And so, so we see this as a sequence of activities that starts off with this higher level analysis, cybersecurity requirements methodology, and then leads as you get more into the design of more structured language-based assurance approaches that would lead you to more formal methods. And that's a, an area that we'll be exploring further. So if I were looking at this early on in the stage, you know, what would I look at? Um, and so what we did on this project is we, we posed a scenario we developed a threat con ops. We ran through the security requirements methodology, looking at assurance case modeling practice. Uh, we built the model, and then we looked at system threat, risk, and cost modeling in that space as a trade space opportunity to derive sets of requirements. Um, 
our scenario is kind of interesting. So right up front in this program, um, my son was leading a, a class on wargaming and scenario development at Georgia Tech Sam Nunn School. And I asked his students for a semester to concentrate on attacks on that would be interesting in terms of modeling and measurement. And so one group of students came up with this, what we call Black Monday scenario. And not to go through the details, but what they envisioned was a, a case where, where Russia was suffering from economic trauma, uh, particularly in their oil and gas markets. And they posed a nation state driven attack on Middle East oil pipelines. And so there's three pipelines in the Middle East, three large pipelines that carry quite a bit over 10 percent of global oil availability and so this attack which would be an advanced persistent threat attack um, would degrade that oil flow uh, significantly significantly enough to create a one month 30 day estimated 31 billion dollar market price impact um, which would then allow Russia to benefit in the oil futures market. And so we can kind of quantify cost type measures all the way up and down this chain. So it helped us to try and understand what the value of the attack would be in order to understand what the attack scenarios would be. And so you can see at the scenario level, we're really thinking about a mission level point of view here. This is a mission attack protection strategy. So we set off to, to model this particular attack. Um, and none of us actually really had any experience with oil and gas pipelines as we went in. And so it was actually an interesting process to let the red, blue team and the system engineering teams model this. So we, we devolved an advanced persistent threat that uses social engineering, you can see here on the right, to infiltrate a set of, of equipment in oil and gas pipelines that's associated with pump control and pipeline flow. And that's what we wanted to model. And so you can see all the things in this coordinated attack. Uh, this was quite interesting because it was uh, actually a fairly unique scenario looking at advanced persistent threat activities in a major infrastructure in that space and, and devised on how, how we could do that. Um, it's also interesting in that this type of system has distributed stakeholders, different people provide different parts and benefit from different parts, and it tends to lack a system of systems view. Um, and so we had a fairly significant process up front to capture the models for this. And we ended up using a CONOPS document format to try and organize that complexity in system engineering terms. And it turned out that that turned out to be pretty useful. So Peter talked earlier about the cybersecurity requirements methodology. Um, so we have the yellow team, the system engineering team, that's writing this CONOPS document, that's modeling the system. Uh, we have uh, the, the blue team, interested stakeholders coming in and helping us understand what are the operational risks in that space. Um, and then we have the cyber, the red team, cyber vulnerability and attack people. Um, looking at how you can infiltrate the system and then going back to, to develop these prioritized resilience solutions. And so a couple things that were done in this, one of the things I think that's very valuable is that the system engineering team who is describing oil and gas pipeline operations as a system model and the risk assessment team that's trying to help us understand concepts of loss and the attack team, the red team that would be looking at vulnerabilities and attack structures, they're actually all working together in the same modeling environment. So they're seeing the same things in terms of their capabilities as they're built along the way, which gives them a whole lot more insight into the system. The other thing this allowed us to do was to simulate the effort that a cyber attack team would have to go to to devise this attack. So they would have to learn about all these aspects of the pipeline pumping stations and associated things like that. And so we kind of actually attempted to measure the number of hours we spent modeling this in order to provide some estimate of the amount of effort that a, a, a cyber threat would need to go to in order to carry out this attack. And so we actually learn a lot 
just by having these three perspectives all integrating together in the model space. Um, just to walk through the CONOPS, um, we did struggle on how to capture this, and I won't go through the details of this, but we developed a CONOPS, which is not a model, it's more of a paper document, it guided us, so we could capture the current system description, the threat situation in terms of how these systems might be attacked, and then the concept of the proposed system, which would be the updates to the system together in one space at the top level. So you think of a CONOPS as the current system and the changes needed to make the future system, the threats changing the system, and the engineers are devising the resilience modes that would protect the system. Um, and then also working our way down this CONOPS process to understand how we take that high level scenario that the students came up with at Georgia Tech and then decompose it down into sets of operational scenarios that could be linked to different types of attacks in that space. So, um, so that proved to be pretty useful. Um, if you look up this report on the CERC website, there's also uh, the copy of the CONOPS document is included as part of that. And so that's available um, as an example. So as Peter talked about, if you um, heard his presentation before mine, um, this cyber security requirements modeling has a set of steps that you perform to capture things into this meta model. And as Peter mentioned, if you didn't hear it, um, we are using the Vitek Genesis environment to build this meta model. Um, it was convenient. It had some meta modeling capabilities that, that make the effort left, less to, to define the meta models. Um, because it's implementing a early version of SysML 2.2, 2.0 meta modeling environment. And just to kind of walk through the details, what you'll see in this model, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to walk you through the actual model here in a minute. Um, things like components, interfaces, and links are what, as well as data items, the light blue and green here are things that you would normally see in a structural model of the system. Um, so think block definition diagram format here. Um, things in the yellow are things that you would normally see in a behavioral or functional description of the model in the space. And so, so we used um, functional flow block diagrams as, as the methodology to look at these functional aspects. Um, we center in the middle of that with a descriptive piece of information that we call the loss scenario. This is where the safety and security and other people are dreaming up these scenarios at the top level, and they're using the loss scenario to drive into the stamp process. So stamp then allows us to look at unsafe control actions that lead to hazards that eventually leads to those losses, and then to look at the variations of, of control and feedback that would allow us to derive new functions to protect against those. And so now we've explicitly modeled the stamp analysis process in the modeling environment, and, and you can see how we've done that. Um, and then the other two components of the system, the Sentinel, the thing that monitors the system for anomalous behaviors and protects against the loss scenario is mod modeled. And I can say in this particular model, on a pipeline and gas model, we didn't go into a lot of detail on those patterns. Um, and then the resilient modes, which would be new functions or new functional flows that go into the system can be explicitly modeled as you go forth. And so we can organize this in a way that makes sense uh, in the space. Um, so at this point in time, I'm going to jump over and I want to actually show you some of this stuff in the model. Um, this model I'm going to show you, it is published out. It's openly available at this particular GitHub site. So you can go and explore it. It's not a complete model, but you can go see how some of these things are linked together. And the key thing to understand is how the meta model links the system design to the hazard analysis to the assurance analysis, and then to the Sentinel monitoring and resilience modes, and then also to the threat attack vectors. All these things become explicitly linked 
together in the model through this process. So I'm going to jump over to this meta model <laughs> in the space. And so you can see um, what we've done is this is all the components of the model here uh, in folders on the left. But what we do is we organize them into packages. Um, and so step one is a system description. The system has an architecture and behavioral set of models. Step two is the operational risk assessment. You can see the risk here. This is actually where you go through the whole stamp process. Step three are the resilience patterns that might be employed to counter those risks. And then step four are the red team attack structures and, and vulnerabilities in the space. And so we can go and we can actually look at some of these things as you go through that. So starting at the system architecture level, um, let's just look at the system context. So there's a verbal description. Um, but just looking at the physical block diagram, you can see the basic structure of what we're talking about in terms of this modeling environment. So, so you have the oil and gas pipeline system, that's the core of your model. And then you have this separate mission aware system, which is monitoring the oil and gas pipeline for anomalies in the space. And you can also see that there are things that are external that are actually quite important to model. So the human, the advanced persistent threat, has to be modeled, and that's modeled as a set of attack vectors into the system. Uh, the pipeline start and endpoints, obviously, but then things like the security operations system center. Um, so we actually tried to model the impact of industry sharing information in that space. So there's a human aspect of that. Um, and then, of course, the, the networks that connect them, where these messages, these control messages, will be routed through. So that kind of gives you an idea of the way you start thinking about this in terms of context using the mission aware approach. Um, if I go back and I look at the block di definition diagram, then you can see how we start to build out the functional decomposition of these things. I won't go into any detail there. Um, I'll just drill down quickly into the pipeline itself. Um, and so if we look at that, then you can start to see that we've starting to model the physical components of the pipeline. Um, and the key point there is things that might start representing the attack strategy. So these are the areas of interest. So obviously the SCADA messaging is going to be a primary attack strategy uh, in, in this space, or at least one that we're going to explore a little bit further. And then I can drill down a bit farther into a segment. Um, and so now we're looking at, at one root segment and show the block definition diagram for that. And now you can see what we would normally look at as being a subsystem model that the system engineers would look at. So we're looking at the different elements of the model. I'll just point out at the end that this thing called a smart pig is a maintenance device. So we've actually, because how you maintain the pipelines was significant in the uh, vulnerability structure. We've actually captured uh, maintenance devices into this process as we go forward. Um, and then if you, you can drill down even further to look at things like external entities um, if you want to. And so then you can start thinking in different views in that space. So the advanced persistent threat is the human external entity. So that's just the kind of that gives you the general view of the structural architecture of the model. Um, the behavioral aspects then dive into some different sets of capabilities. And so one of the things that we're actually interested in in our scenario is how we control the segment. So if you re remember our attack scenario, um, the Russian nation state attackers, we'll just call them that fancy bear, had uh, infiltrated the system and they had um, inserted some, some code that allowed them to perform control of pipeline segments in a way that they could disrupt the flow of oil and gas, oil in this particular case. And so we really want to look at how we would perform segment control in this space and because that's going to be where the heart of one of the attacks is and so we can talk about segment control as being 
the sets of control actions and the sets of potentially unsafe control actions um, that we might want to be interested in in that space. So, um, so if I want to go look at this, the easiest way to look at it is as a functional flow block diagram. And so now we can see things start to appeal in a model. And again, this is just the systems engineering view of the model. Um, here's a, a segment request to change the control. Um, and that's handled by uh, a root manager function. There's um, a request to change pipeline pump and valve settings. There's a request to collect sensor pipe status. And all of these things are used to define the control actions that drive the current segment state in that space. There's also the actual transfer of oil and gas, the physical gas that happens in terms of, of the settings that come out of that process. Um, and so now we can start to see the control actions and the states, which is what we want to end up with when we're modeling uh, system performance. And so we're doing this at a fairly high level of abstraction still at this point in time. We haven't picked the parts yet that would be things that might actually be attacked uh, anywhere in here. We're still working this out in terms of, of this concept of a sentinel and, and patterns, right? What are the control actions that that are most vulnerable that we want to protect in conjunction with our with our loss analysis? So um, so now let's go look at risk. And as we move into the risk, then we can look at some of the things that we might take as opportunities to uh, change the system behavior in the space. And so one of the risks we want to look at is the root manager segment request, um, which is, is driven through this, what we call might call misdirect flow rate command. And so, so here's a risk that uh, a command is intercepted or otherwise disturbed. And so looking at this misdirect flow rate command, which would be a, a typical type of attack vector, we can see that's associated with a loss, particular loss scenario, a command intercept. It leads to sets of hazards, and those hazards might then produce a loss in this space. And so we can look at these types of things, and you can see um, the particular sets of, of functions that lead to this state represented in a hierarchy document. Now, at this point in time, we actually have stamp and its process modeled explicitly. So we have an unsafe control action that leads to a set of hazards that then lead to a set of losses, uh, noting that it's a variation of a real control action that you would uh, provide. And so you could both model the real control action and you could model the, the risky control action in this particular space. Um, and so this just gives you an idea of how you can take a meta model in SysML and then you can start to represent the data items, the data that's associated with an assurance analysis uh, in that space. So the next step I'll jump to then is just to try and look at some of the cyber activity. So this is the threat uh, in the particular space. And so, um, so what if we have a command intercept attack on a segment in this domain? Um, so one of the things I think, and Peter had mentioned this earlier, that these cyber risk assessment, the threat analysis can be linked back to what are um, actually known behaviors in the real world from this space. So a command intercept is a type of attack where the route manager is caused to incorrectly forward a request. The Sentinel monitors for consistency of that. And so it's linked to set of monitors, SCADA message monitors at the route manager and segment level that would be designed into the Sentinel. It's caused by a known attack vector, uh, a KPEC malicious logic insertion, which is a known different type of attack vector. If you wanted to look at what that is, it's captured into the model uh, as a malicious logic installation in that space. Uh, it affects a component a sentinel root component in this particular case. Um, and it leads to this unsafe action, which we showed up front, which is a misdirect flow rate command action. 
And you can look at this also as a, in terms of a hierarchy. So you can see the loss scenario is now linked per our meta model into that attack vector in that space. Um, and it's also now linked to a set of unsafe actions and a set of resilient modes that might counter it um, or remediate it if you use the language here. So now we've captured a third piece, which is the attack tree effectively into the meta modeling environment. So the last thing that we'll look at is a, a set of resilient modes. And, and so, you know, one example of a, um, a resilient mode in this place might be a diverse res redundant sensors. If we look at the hierarchy for that, then you can see when we look at diverse redundant sensors, we can see all of the things that actually have to be considered as part of a diverse redundant approach in this system. So the segment controller and the associated sensors, they all have to be considered as linked into that particular resilient mode with information. Um, they are managed by this perform segment control function, and they're recovered by a, a set of activities. And this one, in particular case, it's a monitoring pipe sensor status. If I actually go back and look at that segment controller function, you know, then I can actually go back and I can see the functional flow dot block diagram where that exists, which is the same one we linked to before. Now we don't, in this model, we don't have those things, uh, the actual resilient modes implemented yet, um, but this allows you to see how they're linked together <coughs> in that space. So the value of this, um, going back through this process is, is this idea that we can formally link the assurance process in a standard way to the modeling activities that the system engineering community would normally do to model a complex system of system like that. Um, we did want to look at metrics in top level and bottom level. So this is an example of some of the metrics that might come out of the process. So we can, of course, prioritize loss as high, medium, and low. That's sort of an input into the system. Um, but then we can look at things associated with the loss scenario formally, like the likelihood of attack, but also how long the system would take to detect those attacks uh, based on the models. And, and you might actually program those into a, a simulation in that space. We can look at uh, metrics associated with the resilient modes. So for instance, how many seconds it takes it to restore um, normal operation. And then we can drill these back up. And the point here is we can start to make trades on um, what would be known as minimum acceptable insurance based at looking at priority of loss versus the cost of and performance of one of these particular modes. And we can start to pull these out of the model in the domain. So in summary, security, safety, and these other factors can be explored in an integrated process focused on concepts of loss. It's particularly valuable in the early stages. Um, it considers four modeling goals, the model of the system and its mission, the modeling of this concept of reasonable insurance, the, the insurance process, modeling the engineering rigor, and modeling the system resilient patterns that you would apply and they can be captured into an MBSE tool. Um, and so this allowed us to produce a, a public model. Um, just to wrap up um, here, we do have a um, follow on to this, which is focused on transitioning. Uh, and that transition is, is basically three areas where we thought we needed to explore process and tool interoperability in order to make this more useful to put into practice. And so one of those, because we're actually kind of focused on earlier stage concept development in terms of value, was a better integration of the meta modeling process with the mission engineering activities that are going on um, that, that were talked about in our panel and earlier on today. So, so the process that the community is using to do mission engineering um, can consider meta models of components and losses of components associated with a particular mission early on. And we want to go explore that 
in particular in conjunction with the Defense Department's cyber risk assessment activities that they're doing now that are trying to understand mission resilience in this domain. So how do we actually capture concepts of mission resilience um, into these modeling activities? Um, back on the far other end of that very first slide on assurance, um, there's tool interoperability problems. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to mature the meta model over time where it actually links into uh, more detailed models that can do software code generation and formal assurance analysis. And so in particular, um, DARPA did a set of programs called Hackums and Case um, that use the AADL modeling environment and modeling language and a, a tool called Resolute, which was a formal assurance language generator in that space in order to produce software code, assured software code. And, and so the idea here is we've got a very conceptual view of what that computer looks like that's going to be running this code at the meta modeling language. It needs to integrate into a more explicit view that actually models the, the operations of the computing system itself in order to um, be formally correct in that space. And then the third area, which um, has come up in both the Silver Shush um, study that was done and this uh, study is that the, the tools within a SysML environment are pretty rudimentary to do dynamic simulation so that you can see the effects. Um, and so we wanna explore the integration of the meta model with better dynamic simula simulation tools, MATLAB, Sim Simulink, and others. And so can we move back and forth or integrate in different modeling environments? And so these are, the first one is, is primarily associated with more process interoperability, whereas the other two are really gonna be more focused on tool interoperability to get from this kind of higher level view of the meta model down into the detailed views that we need to have. And so at this point in time, big questions. So actually, Tom, I guess um, I have a question then too. Uh, most of these um, things with the Sentinel kind of uh, focus on more like attacks, um, but can it actually be applied to just efficiency? In other words, um, can it actually help to monitor just regular flow and if there's variation in terms of like oil pipe flow can actually make adjustments from there so um i think that the one of the main things i think to think about is that this is associated with concepts of loss and so um if your loss is due to a safety issue if your loss is due to a security issue if your loss is due to just a normal failure a reliability failure in the space, then then we've integrated across concepts of loss. And so these things integrate together. Uh, a key thing in this environment is that what you find is that even though the things that cause the loss are different in those spaces, what they look like when they're in the model in terms of, of you know, model system functionality as well as what you might call resilience modes have a lot of commonality. So a resilience mode that you would apply for security probably would also help with safety and with reliability, whereas a, a security mode that or a resilience mode you apply for for um, something like reliability or integrity would most definitely help on your security side. So there's efficiency to be gained by considering all those. Okay, we actually have another uh, question as well. Um, Sarah Lane would actually like you to speak a bit more about how the model works in evaluating cost risk. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we did not get to the point where we're explicitly defining and evaluating cost risk in, in this bit of research. It was our goal to get to that point. Um, it turns out that um, that at different levels of abstraction, it's quite difficult to do that. Um, and so we we picked one point um, in the space, but we looked at evaluating some other approaches to look at different uh, methods for evaluating cost risk. So what we can do out of the model is we can say that this particular resilience mode costs this much to implement, and it gives you 
the set of performance capabilities. And, and we've modeled that. Um, we also were able to model the idea of a benefit of attack in terms of making money in the oil futures market versus the effort required to go design the attack uh, in terms of labor hours for the threat and, and to gain understanding of the system in order to attack it like that. And, um, and the challenge has been to link those two things together, which we're not quite there yet. We're doing some other research in the CERC looking at um, different types of resilience evaluation methods to link those two together. Hopefully I answered that. Well, that worked for me. Um, that actually kind of, well, we have a few more minutes. We have about um, five minutes. So we'll give it a moment to see if there's any other um, questions that um, might come in. Um, oh, we do have another one over here. Uh, so this is from um, Alan uh, Moulton. What did you use to define um, losses in a stamp sense? We have uh, done some work on um, systematic methods for um, eliciting loss definitions, and he would love to compare notes. So <clears throat> I may not answer that question completely the way you're asking it in the space. Um, so what the cybersecurity requirements methodology does is, is it tends to bring the um, stakeholders together, particularly the red, blue, and yellow teams, into a kind of a, a wargaming environment to think about concepts of loss and to discuss a prioritization of those things that were loss. loss. And so in this particular scenario, we started with the concept of loss as being uh, monetary in the space. So these, these oil companies, uh, in the Middle East would lose so much money if, in fact, this attack um, were generated. Um, and so we started off with those things that that would be attacks that that would be associated with with um, monetary loss and gain. <clears throat> and then you can decompose that down to things that then would be associated with that loss structure, which in this case would be to um, disrupt in one way or another flows of oil from end to end through the system. And so the systematic approach then is not so, it's not so quantitative in the space, but anything that would result in a loss of oil flow, whether it was to the environment or whether it was to a blockage in the, in the pipeline or anything like that would be the second level of prioritization in terms of loss in that domain. And then you can drill down from there into a next set of potential losses that would be more associated with the uh, design of a system in terms of the control centers and the SCADAs and, and those other things. And, um, and in this particular case, um, you know, Joe Weiss, who has worked industrial control systems a lot, uh, we mostly um, talked to him and explored uh, his writings on the space in order to uh, work our way down to those concepts of losses and try to capture them in the CONOPS document. So, um, so probably a, to answer your question directly, exploring that concept, that CONOPS document, and then having a discussion with us would be great to compare notes on. Um, that would be with me and Megan Clifford in that space. And so if you send me an email, you know, we could probably set up an external discussion about that. Tom, thank you. So with that, we're about a minute out um, from when the session ends. So I'd like to kind of, and since I don't see any more questions, I'd like to thank everybody um, for attending this talk. I'm glad to see that um, there were quite a few questions uh, with this, and I look forward um, to seeing you all in the next session. So take care and enjoy. Thank you all.